Well, good morning. At the moment, we're doing a, a preaching series on some of the mental health journeys of people in the Bible. And last week, Tim spoke about Elijah, who, when he became depressed and, and discouraged and exhausted, uh, we looked at how God had cared for him gently and encouraged him and spoke to him and really, really helped him lead him out of that dark place. And uh, this week, we're going to be looking at two of Jesus' disciples, Peter and Judas, and uh, having a look at their mental health journey and, and their actions and words around the time of Jesus' arrest and his crucifixion and his resurrection. Now, both men spectacularly failed Jesus around the time of his arrest. And they both had also received a warning, a prediction from Jesus that this would happen. And uh, what each man did when they realised that they had catastrophically failed Jesus, um, let him down, led to two very, very dramatically different outcomes. And we're going to look at those outcomes and, and possible whys um, today. So for Peter, um, what he did was he, he denied knowing Jesus publicly. Um, he disowned him. Um, but we know that this story ends well. Uh, his outcome was that he went on to become an apostle. He had an international ministry. He wrote letters which are now part of the Bible. Uh, and he fulfilled his commission from Jesus that he would be the rock on which Jesus would build his church. Whereas for Judas, that's Judas Iscariot, um, on the other hand, he betrayed Jesus to the chief priests. Uh, but he went down a very different route. His story is a dark one. It's one of despair and hopelessness. And he went down a route where, which led to him ultimately taking his life. He commits suicide. And I found myself wondering what it was about each man that could have contributed to such a different outcome. Both men were with Jesus for three years. They were learning directly from him. Both were part of his inner circle of disciples during Jesus' ministry when he was preaching and performing miracles. The two accounts of Peter and Judas um, follow on from each other in Matthew's Gospel, chapters 26 and 27. And they're actually next, next to each other in the narrative. And by being... Next to each other, we get a really stark picture of this wildly different mental health journey that they were on. So looking at deeper, I think the Gospels provide us with several glimpses of, into their lives and their stories of Peter and Judas to help us understand a bit more of each man's mental state and what contributed to these outcomes. Uh, one going down the route of reconciliation and restoration, the other ending his life. So let's begin by looking at how they failed Jesus. And I'm going to be reading from Matthew 26. This is, this is Peter. After Jesus had been arrested, Peter publicly disowning him three times. Matthew 26, verse 69. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway, where another servant had girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. And then he began to call down curses. He swore to them. I don't know the man. Immediately the rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. And the key part for this, of this story for me has to be that he wept bitterly. Um, firstly, we can get a, a bit of a feel for why that weeping would have been so bitter and painful by looking back on Peter's reaction when Jesus had actually predicted this moment that he would disown him. Um, and his reaction at that time, it was, it was um, after the, the Last Supper, Jesus had said this, this very night you will all fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the shepherd of the flock will be scattered. But after I've risen, I'll go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. Now, Peter was absolutely adamant um, that he wasn't going to do this. He had, his, his sense of 
identity must have been somehow been based on the fact that he was the disciple who was who was going to be loyal. He was prepared to die rather than disown Jesus. And that's how he sees himself. He, he wants and how he wants other people to see him. He's the one that even if everyone else falls away, um, I'll be by your side, Jesus. So when in his moment of fear and weakness... In that courtyard, he does deny knowing Jesus three times. His self-identity as the passionate, loyal one must have been absolutely shattered. So, as well as a a crumbling sense of self and self-identity, what else might have been going on in that bit of weeping? Well, I'm going to suggest shame. He would have felt shame. Shame that he was too fearful to stand up and be counted as one of Jesus' disciples. Shame that his claims were empty. Shame and unworthiness that he had denied the man he knew to be the Christ. Other things in the mix? Confusion and grief about changed expectations. Peter would have expected Jesus' ministry to go down the route of triumph and victory, possibly even using physical forces. But... Um, Certainly not this, not Jesus being arrested and later condemned to death. And there'd have also been a deep sadness, deeply sad to have been so disloyal to his friend, Lord and Master. Peter loved Jesus. He was passionate about him. In Luke's gospel telling of the same story, we get this additional piece of information. Luke 22, the same event includes these extra words. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him before the rooster crows today. You will disown me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. So that verse 61, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Jesus knew at that moment that they must have had eye contact across the courtyard or something that Peter had disowned him. And Peter knew that Jesus knew. I did a thought experiment. I tried to imagine if Mike, my husband, was being hounded by a group of accusers, say, falsely accusing me about something, and in this moment of need, when he needed me to stand by him, I publicly disowned him, said I didn't know him. And if I knew that Mike had heard me say that, I'd be in agony thinking just how much I would have hurt him, hurt the person I loved. So those are some of the possible feelings in the mix of Peter's bitter weeping and how he realised, when he realised the enormity of what he'd done. Straight after this, at the beginning of Matthew 27, we read about Judas. The way that Judas failed Jesus was that he betrayed him to the chief priests, Matthew 27. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man, arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Do what you came for, friend. And the men stepped forward, seized Jesus and arrested him. So like Peter, Judas Judas had already been warned, given a prediction. Here's how Jesus predicts it at the Last Supper, Matthew 26. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after another, surely you don't mean me, Lord. Jesus replied, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The son of man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to the man who betrays the son of man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. And Jesus answered, you have said so. Then Judas goes out and leads the armed crowd from the chief priests straight to him. And like Peter, he also has a moment of realisation of how awful the thing he's done really is. The Bible says he was filled with remorse and tried to undo his actions. So Matthew 27, when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I've sinned, he said, for I've betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us? They replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. Two very different outcomes to men who, when they realise how badly they've let Jesus down, um, respond very differently. Jesus, um, Peter weeps bitterly. Judas takes his life. 
I'm going to suggest that weeping is just about the most healthy thing we can do when facing overwhelming emotions and that suicide is the ultimate act of self-harm. Let's look at each man again, their actions and personality. What do we know about them before the, these events took place? What hints do we have of their emotional makeup that could have led to such different outcomes? Well, in Peter, we see things that would have contributed to his positive mental health and the good outcome. Firstly, Peter knew how to express himself honestly and freely. For example, at the Transfiguration, when Peter sees Elijah and Moses talking to Jesus on the mountain, he offers to build a tent. Now, we laugh, um, but it was the reaction of a, an innocent, godless man who doesn't hold back. He doesn't conceal his emotions. He's not wearing a mask. There's no processing. He just says it. He says his thoughts as they are. And he spoke the truthful thoughts in his head. He was honest and real. Secondly, Peter knew that by failing Jesus, um, that wasn't the end. He'd already had previous experience of getting it wrong, receiving a rebuke and knowing that things can move on. Now, we know this because straight after Peter declares Jesus to be the Christ, he then um, asks him not to go to Jerusalem because it's too dangerous. And Jesus rebukes him, saying, behind me, Satan. Wow, that's a severe rebuke. That could have felt like the end to Peter. But Peter isn't chucked off the team. Um, that's not the end of his discipleship. We don't know how hard Peter took it or how long it took him to process it. But he does continue as one of Jesus' disciples fully on board. So Peter had previous experience of failing, disappointing Jesus, having been rebuked and knowing that you can move on from this and still be as close to Jesus as before. Now, Mike and I uh, know a married couple from previous church where um, both of them had come from a broken marriage, uh, from a broken marriage. Their parents had split up. And uh, when they first had their first big row, they were absolutely devastated because they thought, well, that's it. The marriage is over. Um, but with wise counselling, they worked through it, and they're still married 25 years later. But their problem wasn't the row. Um, their problem was the lack of previous experience of seeing couples work through a row. Um, they had no mental model of reconciliation and forgiveness and restoration, how you can work through it. Now, Peter, in his moment of failing Jesus, did. He knew that you get second chances, you can get forgiveness, and that getting something wrong, you're not written off. And thirdly... Uh, Peter was passionately devoted to Jesus. His relationship in, with to Jesus included devotion. He, we've already talked about his declaration that he would stand by Jesus, whatever. Um, he would have also felt a, a gratitude when Jesus healed his mother-in-law. Um, there's also the fact that Peter was the first one to identify Jesus as the Christ and uh, commission, Jesus commissioned him to be the rock on which he built him, his church. So in everything Peter does, his, his devotion, his passion comes through. And with these aspects in mind of his makeup, the ability to express himself honestly, knowing the failure doesn't mean the end, and devotion to Jesus, that meant that when Peter's moment of truth came, he realised how badly he'd failed. He did the most healthy thing he could possibly do. He wept bitterly. And he will have wept about his shattered sense of identity, the shame of his failure, the confusion over thwarted expectations, and the sheer hurt of knowing you've hurt someone you love. And undoubtedly, the weeping would have carried a component of repentance as well, sorrow at his sin. So I want to talk about crying, expressing the pain. Emotion means movement outwards, letting it out. Not, uh, not expressing emotions, uh, but instead bottling them up uh, and pushing them down and hiding it. That's actually a really dark path down towards mental health problems. Um, suppressed anger that that leads to that can lead to depression but so good mental health needs honest expression of emotions i worked for over a decade as a music therapist and my main goal in any session was to help the person experience a safe place where they could honestly express themselves to be real authentic it didn't have to be with words it could be with music but emotion coming out and weeping, I believe, is a God-given human mechanism to express emotions, joyful and painful. We weep for both joy and pain. And at the tomb of Lazarus, Jesus wept. And the shortest verse in the Bible, John eleven thirty five, Jesus wept. So Jesus wept uh, with the emotion of expressing compassion for his friends and also his own grief for his friend dying. And that healthy expression of, of emotion, it, it requires honesty, saying, yes, this really hurts. Yes, I'm hurt. Yes, I'm angry. Yes, I'm frustrated. Yes, I'm disappointed. So Peter's journey was an honest one, expressed through weeping. But knowing there was hope and a future, 
And Jesus had repeatedly told his disciples he would rise from the dead, although they were slow to grasp this. Peter would have held that hope for reconciliation. By contrast, Judas. Less is known about his personality, but we do know that he had the role of treasurer. Uh, and within that role, the disciples caught him stealing money. Uh, a woman takes an incredibly expensive person, just perfume and just pours it out on Jesus' feet as an act of devotion. John 12, 46. Here's Judas's reaction. Um, Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. So there would have been an uneasiness and tension around Judas's feelings towards the group and in his relationship with Jesus, perhaps he already felt himself the outsider, the, the black sheep of the group. His area of weakness was money, and it was the payment of 30 pieces of silver that convinced him to betray Jesus to the chief priests. But when Judas realised that, that Jesus had been condemned after his arrest, um, Judas felt remorse and tried to undo his actions, and when he couldn't, he took his life. So suicide, taking your own life, is the action of a man who had no hope at all. He saw no way forward. The pain of, the, of having done this wrong thing was too hopeless. He saw no fix, no way out. Without hope, Judas was overwhelmed with despair. So he ended it. The remorse might have been his first step towards re repentance and reconciliation. Peter was forgiven what he did. But Judas didn't have that hope and understanding, as Peter did. We talk a lot about having hope as Christians, but these stories actually put flesh on what that hope might actually look like. If Judas had had hope, he would have known, like Peter, that our relationship with Jesus can always be restored. If he'd had hope, he would have known that expressing this pain would have brought healing. With hope, he would have known that repentance would have brought forgiveness. And he would have known that, that if he'd had that previous experience um, of knowing that he could be forgiven, that he could have been um, forgiven and restored with God. God gives another chance. He would have held on to the words that Jesus said that he was going to rise from the dead. So in our moments of bitter weeping, here's Psalm 34, verse 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. What happens next for Peter? How does the Lord save him and restore him um, with his crushed spirit? Well, the story doesn't end with weeping for Peter. Next comes a beautiful moment of reconciliation. John 21, after the resurrection, Jesus appears to people, Peter and he re-established that, that relationship. It's an interesting approach that he takes. Often we think that all we need to really get close to God is to be told by God how much he loves us and to really be able to take hold of that. That's true. That's part of it. Um, but here, Jesus makes Peter make his own confession of love back to Jesus. He knew that Peter needed to say out loud that he, Peter, loved Jesus. He pushed for it over and over, kept asking. And um, sometimes our route out of a low place might be require us to act. Um, we have to find courage and the words to say to Jesus, I love you. Following you is what I want. The greatest commandment of all is that we love God with our heart and soul and strength. So after that reconciliation comes recommission with Jesus' words, feed my lambs, take care of my sheep. Feeding the flock may be a reference back to the original prediction that Jesus would deny him when Jesus said the shepherd would be struck and the sheep would be shattered. And this also isn't the first time Jesus had said he would build his church on Peter. Um, but rather a restatement of it. He's saying, take up the reins of the shepherd here on earth feed my flock. So after honesty, repentance, weeping, reconciliation and restoration comes recommissioning. Peter's back on track. Now these stories show us that the pathway to emotional health involves intense, intense emotional honesty, being courageous enough to express it. In my household we try to speak out with words if we're finding things tough. We say out loud, it's hard being isolated from your friends during this pandemic. I miss hugging my parents. Dan can't go and see his girlfriend. This passage shows that the power of an honest expression of those painful ex emotions um, is the right thing to do. And that as Christians, we're encouraged to weep with those who weep. And if we are weeping on our own, we're always seen by our Heavenly Father who's with us. 
His stories assure us that we cannot fail so badly that there is no restoring or healing. God promises to forgive the repentant. He promises reconciliation when we seek him out. He promises the future of good things to his children. And as Christians, we can model this restoration of forgiveness in our lives to others who haven't had this experience. So I'm going to finish by asking Richard to read um, these verses from Isaiah 61, 1 to 3. Jesus speaks them later. He himself speaks them in the temple and claims them for himself. Um, So thank you. Thank you, Richard.